Good evening. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started right now. Uh, apparently my video, I can't tell my video. Oh, there it is. It's only showing the top of my forehead right now. Sorry about that. It's uh, trying to get this camera thing switched situated and it's been kind of a fun deal. Anyways, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, going into, uh, and I should say, go, we, I kind of covered over a little bit on, um, on Tuesday about computer systems. And today, what I would like to do is kind of go over a little bit about some of the sensors. And uh, you probably have been doing some testing on some of the sensors uh, in lab, but I, I kind of want to kind of give a little background on them, just because some of the main ones, and I'll also be putting up some more videos as we go along, uh, you know, th through the rest of the uh, week. Anyways, th let's go ahead and get started. One of the most common ones that we use quite a bit is a actual coolant sensor, and we do this kind of sensor on different, you know, parts of the vehicle. It's not just in the fuel management, where we talk about drivability and engine performance. It also is used in air conditioning and, uh, you know, transmissions. Uh, you know, it, it really depends on what you know, kind of a module it's supporting. So what I want to do is go ahead and get started here. And we should be, hopefully I got the right one up. And we, uh, I actually got the, the next one up. So hang on just one second, folks. I'm going to go back to the one I should have. All right, uh, this one, and, and uh, let's go back. I have got uh, so many windows open right now, it's not even funny. All right, now I think I should have it. And I still don't have it. Let's see. All right. Let's go ahead. There we go. Now we got it. I knew I had the right slide in there. Anyways, we're going to start talking about temp sensors to start off with. And some of the things that I uh, kind of want to point out is, like I said, they are used from different uh, parts of the vehicle and different systems. But what we want to kind of focus on is for uh, engine performance. And with engine performance, we rely on for the warm up cycle uh, to get, you know, for the fuel trim, which, you know, the, you know was it rich or lean? And we also use it, uh, you know, uh, for timing too. So this is one of those uh, critical um, uh, 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 sensors that are, are fed into the computer. Uh, we talked about, you know, the different sensors coming in uh, to the computer, so the computer can actually uh, take that information and do its calculations through its mapping. So. Uh, this is a typical looking sensor. It's not, you know, I do want to point out that not all of them are in this spot. Not all these sensors are, you know, looking the same as this one. This is just a, a an idea of what one might look like. Now you may have one up on top, <coughs> excuse me, that actually is really easy to access. Sometimes you don't even have that. Sometimes you have the sensor that is you know, buried underneath the intake manifold and this is uh, one right here that you have right here is a coolant sensor. This is actually for measuring the temperature of the coolant. You, you also have a sensor in, uh, in the vehicle uh, for uh, engine management for uh, you know, air temperature coming in. Uh, we actually have uh, different sensors uh, for the fuel temperature. So all of it's fed in and then the computer can do its calculations by using the sensor. Now. Uh, the sensor that we're talking about, you know, right here, and this is, I'm, I'm going back to the coolant sensor for right now, but this sensor itself is what they call thermistor. This has got a, uh, a, a very uh, different, uh, different type of resistor. Uh, resistors, as we know by electrical theory, as we take and heat them up, the, the actual resistance increases. Well, with the thermistor, it goes the opposite. It has a high resistance when it's first, you know, you know, cool or cold, and then it actually drops its resistance in the process of heating up. Now, this is important because when you start doing your measurements, you need to know, you know, that it starts up, you know, high when it's cold, 
and then you start doing your mapping and all this is important to know now if, if you uh if you do uh want to compare to temperature it's a good idea to have the actual manufacturers uh you know documentation uh and, you know we can guess but it, if you really want to go into our, down to critical we need to know that you know resistance and where it cor correlates with temperature now the quick thing is to do is to go ahead and grab you know a scan tool and actually you know pick up the temperature from there but if we we get you know you know some bogus readings like maybe we have a resistance in the wire you will have you know you know if i have a resistance to the wire i will actually see a, ch a change which again, you remember I said higher resistance means you know, you know cooler. Well, that can really be critical when we start doing our you know, measurements uh, because now I've got this stacked on you know resistance, which is going to say the engine's always cold or it's cooler than it actually is. So it's important to know that, especially when we come to energy performance and we start looking at emissions or output going on it too. So this is just a curve of what the you know, temperature is versus the voltage reflect from that sensor. Now, how that works, now here's a, 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 a kind of a, a graphic a depiction of what uh, a computer would look like. So your PCM being the computer here has some resistors inside the actual uh, computer that actually we use to actually, you know, there's different types of systems out there. Chrysler uses what they call a two-step and it actually goes through these different resistors and it takes and that information from that sensor and puts it into this um, this actual board and now it can actually split it and make it a tighter uh, um, a tighter uh, you know look at what temperature it is so it, it goes up uh, to a certain amount and I got a, a graphic to show you a little uh, in a few minutes now a standard you know old style uh you know system would be it just has that you know ect or the the uh, temperature sensor going in and then we have an actual computer you know, actually looking at that and depending on what the voltage reflected back it would actually say okay i'm at this temperature now one thing i do want to point out uh this ect here is a analog signal coming in and with an analog signal coming in like we uh, talked about on Tuesday uh, that actually has to go through a analog to digital converter because the computer is not going to know what that means it needs to know a digital signal coming in now here is what I was talking about a few minutes ago so this one actually has a transition that steps and what I mean by that is it will start high because what all thermistors do and when it gets down to about this 0.96 voltage, it's gonna jump back up through those resistors. And now it's gonna kind of go fi more finely on down. So this is like above 120 degrees and it comes on down and, and then it goes up to, and, and hopefully you never see an engine that's at, actually at 275 degrees. That would be very, very hot, but it's capable of doing that. So the whole just one sweep down is not on this particular one. How we test uh, coolant sensors, uh, yeah, you can take uh, resistance me measurements. You can take and hook your, uh, you know, DVOM up to the sensor. Uh, I would encourage you not to just back probe because uh, you could spread those connectors out. I would get a set of good connectors to do that or have a set of leads that do that. Uh, a little more, you know, precisely, and you can actually dip this uh, sensor in, you know, you know hot, warm and get started off cold and go up to warmer water and depending on the temperature, you can actually have a thermometer or some kind of digital thermometer in the water so you know what the temperature is. Now, is that something that we normally do? Heck no, because that's going to take some time. What I, I prefer to do myself personally is grab that scan tool out. If it looks, you know, like it's about right, and you can actually verify that by taking uh, a infrared gun to the actual, um, uh, to the actual, you know, radiator, you know, uh, and you know maybe at the coolant 
hoses on the upper uh, radiator hose or the lower radiator hose. And you can get a really good idea of what the engine temperature is and then go ahead and uh, compare that to your scan reading, your scan tool reading. Uh, if it looks really bogus, you can go out to the sensor. And then there again, like I said earlier, sometimes these uh, temperature sensors are hard to get to. And we try to think of the easiest and quickest way to do things. But if I have to, and that's, you know, temperature reading is way off, you know, for instance, you know, if it has a temperature reading of very, very hot and you feel the radiator hose and it's not hot, you're going to have to go a little bit farther uh, and, uh, and you're testing. And it could be a bogus uh, sensor, uh, a bad sensor, I should say, or it possibly could be a bad wiring. Uh, there, that is another you know, possibility and it, it happens uh, depending on you know, the maintenance of the vehicle and also if it's, the vehicle's been in a crash. I've had a few uh, crash uh, situations that after it gets out of the body shop, it comes to, uh, would come to our shop and we'd have to diagnose what else is wrong with it. So that's just uh, one way of doing it this way here. Uh, this is another uh, you know, type of uh, a circuit uh, for an actual engine uh, temperature sensor. And, and this is just a wiring and we can actually, one of the things I like to do if I have you know, a sensor that's uh, you know, close enough and, and, and accessible, let's put it that way. And I can actually do some voltage do drops across it to verify connections. Uh, and, and I do this you know, quite a bit. I, I've got some quick you know, steps that I do when I'm doing the diagnostic and on that. So one of the quick steps, I wanna check for wiring to see if it's any good or not. I'll actually take the uh, connector off the temperature sensor now, when I take that off, remember that uh, it should be very high resistance and you're gonna see a very low temperature on your scan tool, okay? And it's gonna say, wow, it's like freezing cold. Uh, it's minus, you know, 40 degrees. I forget what the temperature actually goes down on a sensor, but it's gonna be very, very cold. And then what I'll do is, you know, it's still again with the key on. Sometimes on, you know, some of the vehicles you have to key them on and key them off and then key them on again to get an update on the temperature especially when it's not running, but I'll also take and take a like a little connector. Remember, make sure you get a connector that fits nice and tight. Uh, don't spread you know, the connectors apart because you're going to cause a false, you know, connect, you know, to where it's not going to make a good connection. I have a set of leads that I use. And then I go ahead across the two and I'll ground it. And if I jumper that across, okay, not ground, but jumper it across, it should show because now the resistance is way down uh, or it should be almost no resistance and you should see a very hot temperature. So, you know, one of the th things that you would, you, you know, you learn early on is how to do quick, easy tests to verify things. And that's my verification for the wiring harness. If I have, let's say I take it loose and it's still showing very high, uh, you know, you know, I should say, very cold still, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look for some kind of connection between the computer and the, uh, you know, the connector to actually see if it actually hasn't opened in that wiring someplace. And, and it's possible it could be a computer, but it's very unlikely. And then if, it, you know, if I do take it off and you know, it, let's say we started off very, very, you know, it was very, very cold and you know, off the scale type cold, and then if I take it off and it doesn't change and then I jumper it and then it, you know, all of a sudden I'm very, very hot. I know that it's going to be in that sensor itself. So these are little quick little you know, steps that you can do on diagnosing those. Uh, this is again just showing uh, this one's an actual stepped type, uh, you know, temperature, you know, and so it decreases. Like we said before, it starts off a very, very, uh, you know, high temperature. I'm mean, sorry very, very high resistance, and we actually start dropping off. So this is kind of that reflect coming on down and after a period of time. And this is where we'd be kind of grafting that sensor. Uh, here is a temperature sensor. So sometimes, you know, we, you know, we, well, I shouldn't say sometimes, sometimes they're outside, sometimes they're actually in the uh, air, uh, air, you know, mass airflow sensor. That this is just depends on how, again, how the manufacturer decided to uh, actually put it together. More and more I've seen they're incorporating in the mass airflow sensor. 
So it'll have extra wiring going on like before. So here is a, uh, a, a good picture of what one be if it was in the ducting. Uh, otherwise, it's going to probably be in that mass airflow sensor. It could be in the intake manifold too. So there's different ways to know, but on your port and, you know, and you, uh, in, in injection systems, a lot, sometimes they had them in the ducting itself. This is, a, you know, again, it, it's typical, the, the same way they do the coolant, they actually do this also uh, with the air charge. And just, you know, that's why they just say temp sensor. And this shows a typical uh, type of uh, sensor. So we have ground coming back. We uh, remember we have to have a completed circuit. So we'll take, you know, you know battery voltage going to the PCM and then the P, uh, PCM will send out a five volt reference. And with this voltage drop going here, this is kind of a variable type resistor here, which is a thermistor, is and as it kind of you know drops this uh, actual voltage, we're going to see a change back here at the computer, and that computer is going to take that and and take it as a uh, um, a volt a different temperature. So that's what it's going to do. Here's another showing a different, you know, this one's actually showing a head temperature sensor. Not again, we're still talking about temperature sensors. And we, like I said, we have different sensors for different types of, you know, what they, the, the manufacturer says, I, okay, I wanna know uh, what the temperature for the coolant is, which is, you know, priority of course. And the air temperature was really priority, especially when you're figuring out, um, you know, uh, uh, different uh, performance issues. And then uh, th they may even have a head temperature too. So if that temperature and that head temperature gets too high, it may go to a, st a strategy to kind of shut down um, uh, the, the vehicle uh, to keep it from, you know, a superheating type thing too. And uh, one of the things that I, I want to make you aware of too, this is all recorded in the computer and uh, actually manufacturers can actually go back to events to see where it's been you know heated or superheated and that would uh, be uh, you know a flag for not you know, covering a warranty if the customer actually allowed it to overheat like that so anyways this is pretty much you know a quick little thing on temperature sensors hang on uh, i'm gonna go into the next segment here i'm gonna actually start talking about um, we're gonna get into a little bit about uh, throttle precision sense and sensors and like that. That's my next little ditty for you guys. So uh, let's go ahead and end this show and get into the next one. All right. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and pull the next one up. And again, th these are sensors that actually feed back to the computer different things. So we talked a little bit about uh, temperature Okay, now we're going to actually uh, use one of the sensors that are actually a, a input from the driver. Now these have changed over the year. I'm going to I'm going to give you a kind of a basic, and we'll be getting into uh, ECT, which actually incorporates a, a system that has two throttle position sensors uh, and to work it, you know, to work the electronic throttle correctly. And we'll we'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, when we in the semester as we go along. Anyways, so let's go ahead and get started here. Share it. All right, so we just get this thing fired up. Uh, this is a uh, again a throttle precision sensor, and this is for uh, demand from driver. Uh, now, uh, it, as you push down on the actual accelerator pedal that actually is going to send a signal back to the computer to give it that, um, that kind of enrichment and, and then timing uh, to accelerate. And way this is old style here, this is a throttle body that actually allows air to come in. And this is going to be on a port injected system on a Ford. I can tell because I've been in the business for a while. But this one has three pins in here. And this is going to actually take and modify a voltage like the uh, coolant sensor did, but the coolant sensor is going to be a two wire. This is going to be a three wire. And let's talk about how this is going to do that. 
Uh, here we have, again, you know, just think of the computer back over here. Okay, so, uh, and we're actually sending that same, that same five row volt reference. The computer is going to send out, you know, just you, our reference voltage is generally going to be five volts, unless you get an older system. There was some systems where you were running around eight or nine volts, but that's, you know, some time ago. Five volts is probably the most uh, common one that we've had. Uh, here is the wiring out. So like we've seen in that computer diagram before, we have a, the computer gets 12 volts going in. It takes in through a resistor and drops that voltage to five volts reference. And here we have in, and here's our ground. The ground's gonna be back into the computer again, because one of the things that happens with the computer, it's gonna check for opens and shorts all the time. And again, we can do these quick little tests like I showed, I kind of talked about on the uh, temperature side, we can actually do them on this sensor too, but it's just gonna be a little bit uh, different because we, instead of having two, we're gonna have three different uh, wires instead. So here I have my five volts going in. This is gonna be my ground going back to the computer. But now instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have this little sweeper. There is a uh, little resistor pad down in here. It's, it, it, it actually changes the resistance as it goes up. So we're going to actually have it go across this. And as it sweeps, it shows a position of that throttle. Now, as we start very, very low, and I'll just give you some ideas of what common um, you know, your readings might be. Here, uh, we have about probably about 5.5 volts uh, coming back to the computer. And it's going to say, OK, uh, we're at idle right now. So go through your idle strategy. Right, set your time and set your fuel at idle. As you accelerate, it's going to go ahead and sweep up. So you see in right here, you see the actual uh, sweeper or the needle going all the way up. And this guy is comes up and now we've come to pretty much the full wide open throttle. So that uh, uh, watt here is actually wide open throttle. And you would actually see probably approximately 4.5 volts. Please don't use those as uh, you know, you know uh, definites when it comes to your diagnosis. You definitely want to take out the manufacturer's uh, you know uh, you know documentation to make sure. If you uh, if you do and you know, it's you know it's a little bit off, you know, don't be be too critical about it. But if it's way off, so like my like a it's when I go all the way a wide open throttle, and I'm only like three point you know five volts. Then I'm going to say, "Whoa, something's going on here. Either I've got a resistance someplace, or uh, you know, I got a bad sensor going on here, or my, you know, it could be. It doesn't happen very often, but you have a five volt reference going out. So you got to want to make sure. And and I, I should have said that on the actual uh, temperature sensor too, but you want to verify that that temp that five volts is you know, coming out or close to it. It may be four point nine nine or something. You know, so I've seen them like five point two. It's not exact, but it's pretty doggone close. So way I normally test these guys, which is pretty you know, quick and simple, is I'll disconnect the connector. Again, I have my special pins to go into it. I'm gonna check on the wiring diagram to see where is my five volts, where is my ground. So a uh, way to check real quick, like you know, jump or cross, on your you know, DVOM. And if you have something close to five volts, you're probably pretty good. And then what I do is I reconnect and I take a back probe here. And this is one time I do back probe. I don't uh, really like to, but I do um, on occasion. And what I'll do is I'm gonna find that one wire like we had before, uh, this guy right here. I'm gonna look at this wire here. So. Uh, this particular uh, diagram is, is uh, at C, and what I would want to do is find out on the connector, because they'll have a connector view too, and I'll take on that pin C and put it on the back, and then I'll let it at idle, and this is one time I really prefer a lab scope. I don't really care to use an actual um, a, a DVOM that, you know, th that much, because there's a lot of information that could be lost. And this is what I'm talking about. If you take a lab scope, remember it's got you know, the voltage over time. And that is gonna be huge when it comes to a sensor like this. 
one, you know, you here's like probably about 0.5 right now, and they've accelerated it as on that lab scope, and they they can actually see that curve coming up, and then when I let go, it drops on down. Well, this is showing me a good clean sweep. I know there's a little bit of a hump over here, but that could have been the driver, you know, not going you know straight and you know and uh, maybe stumbled a little bit when they were accelerating. But if I had something, you know, and this is what happens when you get that uh, complaint about the uh, vehicle stumbling on acceleration. This is one thing you can check, you know, with a lab scope, but it better than you can with an actual um, a DVOM. But if I have it accelerating and all of a sudden I'm still pushing forward, I'm not, you know, letting up. I'm just you know, gradually coming up. And I actually see that that line drop down, and then you you actually feel you know, de, you know, the de quick deceleration or that stumble, and then it jumps back up and it recovers itself. Then you know that it's in the TPS, which it needs to be re actually replaced. And unfortunately, folks, with the electronic throttling systems, if there's a TPS that fails or a you know it, it does have a backup for, with another TPS. But it will flag a light on. It will flag a code, and but uh, it will put itself into limited um, uh, drivability of driving, uh, you, you lower speeds and stuff like that. Uh, it will, um, you know, it it really you know, kills the performance if it does have a fail. And in most cases, it's not one place and part like you've seen there uh, replaceable. It will actually be changed the whole throttle body on it. Uh, anyways, you can use a, a voltmeter, but I'm um, hopefully, well, if you do use a voltmeter, make sure it's a good enough voltmeter that actually has a good refresh rate. In other words, it updates itself all the time. If you don't, uh, you could miss that little drop off. You know, I, I definitely would not, not putting Harbor Freight down, but I would definitely not use a Harbor Freight meter for this kind of thing. All right. Uh, so like I said, here it's showing that five volt uh, reference coming out. See, see, it's not exactly five. And that could be because, you know, you know, just the charge of the vehicle or just the, the way that resistor pushes out. Uh, here is actually showing a ground, you know, on it itself. You know, if it's greater than 2.2 on that, then we have a problem. And then I actually showed you how it actually, excuse me, how it actually uh, to check it or that actual sweep up is actually back probing. That's pretty much, unless you have a special connector that actually has a set extra set of leads on it, uh, you know, plug in and plug in, and then you had the extra set of leads. That would be the other way of doing it. But anyways, all right, folks, um, this is what I have for you today. Um, I, uh, I appreciate you showing up and at least we have two today. Um, ho hopefully we'll get more people coming into the class uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And we'll be going over a you know it's simplified uh, lecture on how the different systems as we go along. Uh, please remember I do post videos of uh, my lectures, and that might help you understand a little bit more. But the main thing is, folks, you need to be doing the reading. If you're not doing the reading and it just relying on the actual uh, lectures to teach you everything, that's not going to happen. You need to do the reading. And I put the reading up in Canvas for you to be doing uh, each week. Uh, uh, if you do have a question for me or you know, you know, Mr. Ingreeson, uh, make sure that you uh, inboxes if uh, you know, in Canvas. So uh, it, it's okay to email us individually, but uh, if there is a question that uh, either or of us can actually answer, uh, we both share the inbox in Canvas. Uh, if you uh, email a question, uh, you know, just say to me, and it's uh, something that be should be uh, uh, answered by Mr. Greason, uh, then I'm going to have to forward your question across. So that that is, you know, the really best way to do it is use the inbox for any kind of questions. If you have a question about your grades, uh, you know, assignments or anything like that, please inbox me, and I will do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. I do you know, put down, you know, it takes 72 hours, but you know, you know, I usually get back to, uh, in, unless I'm in a class within the hour, um, not, don't rely just being the, uh, that hour 
sometimes I get in classes, sometimes I get in meetings and the meetings go for more hours than I care to talk about. But um, go ahead and in inboxes there. If you have a general question, you know, hey, you know, uh, I didn't quite understand this and the class might know it. I put up for you all a uh, discussion um, group. It's called the Student Lounge. This is for you to ask questions amongst each other. Now, I want to encourage you to use something like that. I do have discussion groups, you know, uh, discussion topics, you know, two a week uh, for you to actually join in on. But if you have a general question, and um, it, it could be anything that's class related, uh, if you uh, post in the student lounge, your fellow classmates can actually help you with that answer. Uh, you know, I you, I didn't get it. I didn't understand question number 14 or whatever. Uh, and one of the, you know, your fellow students might have that answer. Uh, so that is a good way of actually um, you know, communicating. And I would like for you all to start uh, networking. Uh, I can't tell you enough how much networking actually helps uh, with, you know, this profession. Uh, it could be you were, a, you know, you networked with somebody in class and years down the road, you, you know, you're looking for another job and one of your classmates remembered you and said, hey, you know, you're looking for a job. You know, I, you know our, our company is actually hiring right now. And that's really huge. Um, networking actually got uh, me quite a few jobs uh, in my career as I went along. All right, so that's what I have for you folks today. Are there any questions before we close out today's uh, lecture part? All right, Cruz. Oh, you, you got a question, Cruz? Uh, yeah, I was wondering, um, I was wondering, you said uh, you had a lecture on Tuesdays, but for me, I'm in, I'm in the lab on Tuesday, so. No, that's, that's fine, uh, Cruz. Don't worry about it because I, I video them. Uh, I actually tape them and I'm gonna, I have them posted. Well, I may not have posted yet. I, wait, I was waiting for uh, the um, audio transcription because we are uh, Title V required to have, um, I say, I'm sorry, Title IX required to have uh, audio transcriptions in all of our videos. As soon as that gets done, I'll be posting it. But oh. I, I did have one on Tuesday, just when you're in your free time, that's why I do it, you know, because, you know, you know, because of the situation where with COVID right now, it's kind of hard to get everybody in one room at one time because of the time. Uh, you're, you're supposed to be in lab on Tuesdays, be in lab on Tuesdays, but just know that, you know, probably towards the end of the week, you're going to see some videos up uh, with the actual uh, PowerPoint. It, it'll be embedded in the PowerPoint. And it, well, I should say embedded, it'll be in the same page as the PowerPoint. And also at the very end of the actual, um, uh, at the other end of the actual uh, Canvas shell and uh, that module, it'll say Zoom lectures. And under that, you can actually watch them in that way too. So they'll be available 24 seven after I get them uh, transcripted. Okay. Well, the... I, hopefully that helps too, okay? It does. Okay, fantastic. So I'm not dinging anybody for not showing up on Tuesday when they're supposed to be in the lab on Tuesday. I'd rather you be getting lab. Uh, really, seriously, I wish we didn't have to do the half and half. I wish you guys could all go at once, but because of COVID, we have to do social distancing and we're limited to how many we, we're having there. And I don't know if you heard, but we're in the purple again. Oh, geez, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, thank you. I hope they answer your question. Uh, Lewis, do you have any questions? All right, I take Sorry, that. Bernard. Okay, very good guys. Thank you for showing up and just kind of remind people in class that we do have them Tuesday, Thursdays. Uh, I'm trying to get them through uh, the actual conference Zoom now because you know, apparently that link wasn't working very well you know, that I was sending out. And so I'm gonna to try to keep it in conference Zoom uh, this uh, last semester, I had some bad ill effects on it. I'm going to monitor it really close because uh, there for a while, conference Zoom was actually uh, every time uh, you know we come to a new date, it put a different time up. And all of a sudden, they're asking you guys to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning. And I'm not <laughs> doing that to you guys. <laughs> all right. 
All right, guys, have a great evening. Okay, keep up on your work. And if you need anything, please feel free to inbox me or like I said, uh, get on there with the uh, actual uh, the student lounge. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, thank Thanks, you. Guys. Have a good evening. You too. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.